Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on getting started with deep learning. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I will also be your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help Australian researchers to achieve their best medical, agricultural and environmental research. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, in Mianjin or Brisbane, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Titus Tang to speak to us about getting started with deep learning. Titus is a senior deep learning engineer at the data science and AI platform at Monash University. He facilitates the development and delivery of various deep learning and AI training events at Monash and also provides advice and hands-on assistance to researchers who are looking to apply deep learning and AI techniques in their research. Welcome to the webinar, Titus, and I'll now hand over to you to start your presentation. Thanks, Melissa, for the introduction. I'll just bring up my screen. All right, so thanks, um, Melissa and Christina from Australian BioCommons for this opportunity to speak here today. Um, my resume probably isn't as uh, prestigious as the various speakers that usually have here presenting at these webinars. Uh, while I do have a PhD, it isn't directly in deep learning, as the field of deep learning was at its relative infancy when I started my PhD. Um, I hope that doesn't make me sound much, too, much older than I am. Um, however, I now do consider myself a deep learning engineer. And almost everything that I have come to learn about deep learning is done through self-learning, largely off the internet. And so I thought perhaps my experience of learning something completely new, mostly by myself, and then converting it into a practical skill, which is essentially what I, uh, my job as a deep learning engineer. I thought this journey of mine could be meaningful to others. And this is what I want to talk about today. So getting started with deep learning is a short and concise um, introduction to what deep learning is, about the key steps you could take, just like I did in order to get started in the field. Um, you can think of today's content as my personalized checklist of things you need to know or to prepare for in order to get started with deep learning. This is um, naturally spoken from my perspective. So please take away from today's talk what you will and adapt it for yourself. So in today's talk, I'm going to assume close to zero technical knowledge about deep learning. I'll be speaking about deep learning at a very, very high level and covering steps that you could take in order to get started with deep learning hands on. And along the way, I'll be uh, providing pointers to various resources. Oftentimes links to those resources will be included in the slides. And um, I believe Melissa will be sharing a link to these slides that you can access in order to uh, access those links if you wish. Um, this lecture is not about discussing in depth how things work inside the black box that is deep learning. We only have about 40, 45 minutes to, to uh, talk about the various things that I'd like to talk, talk about today. And so we just do not have the time to go into a technical discussion about um, how to implement things at the lowest level. But very importantly, I want to emphasize that today's talk is not about machine learning, but about specifically deep learning, a subset of machine learning. So let's start with the question, how is deep learning useful? If you want to learn about something, um, you probably want it to be useful for our research or for our work. You would have probably seen lots and lots of examples of uh, AI in the news or in the literature. And I could confidently say that a huge majority, an overwhelming majority of new advances in artificial intelligence these days 
um, are based off deep learning. And so here are just a small handful among the vast uh, collection of examples that you can look up online. First off is OpenAI's GPT-3. Um, OpenAI is a AI research firm based in, I believe, San Francisco. Um, and they released perhaps about a year ago, the, what was at the time the world's most powerful language model, an AI that is able to generate um, text, language, um, almost at the level of human experts. Um, GPT-3 here stands for Generative Pre-Training, Pre-Trained Transformers, um, which is um, a huge um, AI model with up to 175 billion parameters. Huge model that takes literally months to train, um, but is able to perform tasks at the human expert level. Then we have DeepMind, which is another AI research firm um, bought over by Google. And they have been focusing on various um, reinforcement learning, among others, reinforcement learning, um, artificial intelligences. Um, and what they have showcased these technologies on is often in the, um, in the field of competitive gaming. For example, they have developed AI bots that are able to play the game of StarCraft and the game of Dota at the professional level and they're beating out 99.8% of human players, which is itself a very tough, a very good, great achievement. And then I'm sure you have heard about self-driving cars, self-driving trucks. Um, these have been advancing greatly over the last few years. Um, and I, I think I'm willing to stick my neck out and say that, and, 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 and claim that, you know, I'm willing to trust in the context of um, uh, urban roads, urban and well-developed roads, I'm willing to trust an AI self-driving car over the average human. And um, the last example here is, you know, just, just a point to, to highlight that deep learning is being applied to pretty much any field that you can think of these days. And um, naturally, you can guess that weather predictions is one of them. Um, and you can, you can be, uh, be confident that, that deep learning has been applied to predicting riders um, very successfully these days. Now, moving into something closer to home is AlphaFold, developed by DeepMind by Google. Um, AlphaFold was released perhaps about two years ago, if I recall correctly. Um, and they have developed, uh, it is an AI that predicts the 3D structure of a protein based solely on its genetic sequence. And um, this problem is important to solve because the structure of a protein influences how it behaves in an organism. And malfunction of this structure often leads to various kinds of diseases. Now we know that uh, modeling the physical structure of a protein is difficult because you have to uh, model the interactions of various components of that structure uh, relative to the, uh, to the other structures. But on the, on the other hand, genetic sequencing is relatively easier. And so what FFO has done is to reframe the problem of um, physical modeling into a form that is easier to do. And what this basically does is to say, um, they have collected a bunch of um, um, amino acids. They um, sequence the genetics of these acids, and also they measure the physical properties of these acids. And then they have a model that learns to take in as input the genetic sequence and outputs the uh, physical structures of these assets. And more specifically, they have developed a deep neural network that predicts distances between pairs of amino acids and the angles between the chemical bonds that connect those assets, which is a um, great step forward in the field of, of um, physical modeling. Uh, something at a much smaller scale, but still very useful, is Deep Black Cut. Um, deep Black Cut is an open source Python package um, that allows you to do 3D markerless post estimation using deep learning and neural networks. So effectively, if you're working with animals in a lab and you would like to track the pose, the, the movements and the um, uh, and the, the movements of individual limbs of an animal, what you could do is to use this package, teach a neural network to track these different component, uh, parts of an animal as they move around in their environment. So this package is, as I mentioned, available as a Python package that is open source that, and that which you could quickly adopt into your uh, research workflow. 
And something more towards um, the science of uh, the realm of science fiction is brain to text communication. Here we have a user that imagines writing a character, and a new work, neural network is then trained to um, read electrical signals from the motor cortex of the person and to translate these electrical signals into the characters that the, us that the user is thinking of writing. Um, the researchers of this who, who wrote this paper was able to demonstrate users that are able to write um, at about 90 characters per minute with an accuracy of larger than 99% using a general purpose autocorrect. And this is comparable to the average able-bodied um, smartphone typing at about 115 characters per minute. So this is great for people who do not have, um, who have uh, limited physical abilities to be able to type on the phone, for example. Now, I probably don't need to spend too much time talking about examples of deep learning. You're already here. You are already, you're probably are familiar with what deep learning can do. So let's move on to the next question about what is deep learning. I always like to um, use this example to introduce deep learning. Um, and here we are comparing deep learning with what I could refer to as traditional software development. So let's say you are a tradi traditional software developer or a programmer, and your boss has tasked you with this single task here. Given a, an image, you are to write a computer program that takes in this image, processes it in however you define it to do, and it spits out an answer if uh, whether the image contains a dog or a cat. And the question I want to pose to you here is, how would you go about solving this problem in the traditional software uh, point of view? So normally when I post these questions in the various workshops that I run, um, I get responses like, let's try to detect the differentiate between a dog and a cat by detecting for pointy ears. Pointy ears seems to be the most common um, answer that I get. Um, or uh, the shape of the nose, or the shape of the face, the shape of the stout, um, the size of the eyes, uh, the presence of whiskers, and so on. Now let's drill, in, drill down into one of these specific examples and just, let's just use pointy ears. Keep in mind that computers aren't really the smartest things in the sense that they do exactly what you tell them to do. And so you cannot just tell a computer pointy years because a computer has no understanding of these human concepts that we have constructed. So you really need to go down to the lowest level possible. And at the lowest level, an image is effectively just an array of numbers, where each pixel is just three numbers, usually, um, representing the red, green, and blue channels in that pixel. Now, how will you go about writing some software that takes this, these numbers, processes them in some form to extract what we, what we understand as pointy ears? But what are pointy ears? Well, you could define a set of pointy ears as being um, an ear that, is, that has two straight lines that form an acute angle, for example. But then you need to define what is an acute angle and what is a straight line. Or in, or in fact, you need to define what is a line because the computer has no concept of a line. So, um, and even if you're able to define the concept of a line to a computer, and obviously people have done that, um, you do then encounter situations where you don't see a pointy ear in a cat. Maybe the, the ears are occluded. Maybe the ears aren't pointy. Maybe the ears consist of lines, more than two lines that form the ear. Or maybe you see a different part of a cat that, for which you don't see the ears. So hopefully you get the point that traditional software development is very useful in a lot of sense, but it is also very limited in many fundamental ways. And even in this case of differentiating between images of dogs and cats, um, something that a three or four year old could probably do very well, um, experienced software developers, uh, traditional software developers have trouble uh, writing computer programs that are able to solve this problem. Um, in a general fashion, let a little more complex problems involving different object kinds. So what I've talked about here is can be sort of oversimplified into this simple flow chart here, where first of all, you start with observing the data. And we, we didn't need to do that here because we have looked at lots and lots of dogs and cats throughout our lives. So that part is probably the easiest part here. Next, we need to identify a bunch of features. That is again, very relatively intuitive for us to do. We just have to look 
at the images and pick out what is what are the salient features in those images. And the next step here is probably the most difficult part, if not impossible, part of this whole process. We want to translate these human concepts that we have extracted from our, our data into low level machine executable instructions that a computer could work on. And as we have discussed, uh, this process is difficult and oftentimes impossible from a traditional software de development point of view. And so this is where deep learning comes in and this is where it is so powerful. With deep learning, you can see that the process here is very different. We start off with collecting a bunch of data. We then move on to labeling the data. And by label, I mean to take every single data point that we have and to associate it with a human concept. So for example, in this case, a dog or a cat. We then take all that data and we feed it into a neural network. Now, what's different here is that we do not tell the neural network what features to look out for. It is the neural network's job to say, given this data, these are the features that I should extract as the neural network in order to solve the problem that I'm being requested to solve. So you can think of the neural network here um, automating a process. With traditional software development, what we are trying to do here is to automate the process of executing instructions. We are taking a human concept, we are converting it to low level instructions, and it is the machine's job to execute these instructions automatically. With deep learning, we are taking this process of automation one step further. We are saying, let's not only, uh, let's not only automate the process of executing instructions, we are also now automating the process of defining what those instructions are. And that replaces the hand coding of features, which was previously the impossible part of that process. So if we are taking off the burden from ourselves, the process of hand coding features, then as deep learning engineers, our job now shifts towards the left hand portion of the graph, which is the collection, the curation, and the management of data sets. So in other words, as a deep learning engineer, whenever we are given a problem, our question is not to ask, what are the features I should look out for in my data? Rather, our objective is to ask, what kinds of data should I prepare and should I collect and should I label such that a neural network can do, can do its job best? <clears throat> So that's deep learning at a very, very high level. But you would have seen these terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, thrown around and being used somewhat interchangeably. So I just like to clarify these terms here. Artificial intelligence can be seen as the broad umbrella that encompasses everything. And this is my own definition. Um, I like to define it as any human design system that provides consistent, number one, and beneficially biased output in response to input, number two. I'm using the term here beneficially biased because I find that the words right or correct being a bit too strong uh, in this context. Um, and so artificial intelligence systems could include, include everything, um, pretty much everything in AI, um, but that also includes rule-based systems and any artificial biological organisms that we might create in the future. Within the subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning. Now machine learning is basically a um, the development of a machine that autonomously learns biases from data, what is right, what is wrong, and, and draws borders between what is right and wrong. So you might heard of these terms here, support vector machines, decision trees, random forests, and so on. All of these fall under the umbrella of machine learning, or what I will call traditional machine learning. Deep learning is a very specific subfield of machine learning. And whenever it comes with, to, with deep learning, we always work with deep neural networks. So what are deep neural networks? Well, the name implies that it is modeled of some kind of neural network and um, or specifically modeled of the human brain. The human brain, a large network in itself consists of many, many different neurons interconnected to each other. So in an artificial neural network, it takes pretty much the same structure where we have um, artificial neurons, also, called, also known as perceptrons or cells, whatever you like to call it. Um, each of these take in inputs from the external world or from uh, various other cells, 
it processes those inputs, and then it outputs its process inputs to the next layer, to the next bunch of cells. Now, obviously, in a network, you would have multiple of these cells of these neurons interconnected to each other. And so in an artificial neural network, this is typically how we structure them. Here, each circle represents a single cell. We have cells interacting with each other. Now, each color here represents a single layer. And usually, cells in a layer perform the same task. That being the case, there's usually very little need from cells within a layer to communicate with each other. And so what you see here is the lack of lines between cells of the, rate, of the same color, but lots of lines or connections between cells of um, subsequent layers. So in a neural network, uh, you naturally have an input layer that receives input from the world. This could be, for example, pixels of, a, of an image. You could have an output layer that provides the final prediction that the model is making. And then you can have a bunch of hidden layers in between that processes all that information. The name, the word deep in the name deep learning or deep neural networks comes from the fact that as, as a community, we have figured out that the more layers a neural network has, the more powerful it is, assuming that data is not a limitation. And if that is the case, and the, deep, the word deep here comes from the fact that the best neural networks are often very deep layer wise. And so these days you could have neural networks. It's common to have neural networks that are in, in the order of tens of layers or even hundreds of layers. So that's, a that's the structure of a neural network in a nutshell at a very high level. I think the big question here we want to ask is how does a neural network learn such that it is able to eventually elicit um, artificial, artificially intelligent behavior? And I'd like to call this process a bit of a, informally a bit of a trial and error. Uh, why are a, the formal term, why are formal process called gradient descent? So this blue box here is, you can consider it as a neural network. It takes as input from the world. This could be an image of a dog, for example, and it processes that in, uh, input to provide some prediction or the, our output here. Now, if you recall from before, Whenever we create a data set, we also provide with it labels associated with each data point in that data set. What we then do is to compare the output of the model with the label that we have. The label tells, indicates whether the, the output of the model is right or wrong. So for example, you could have a model predict a number between zero and one, uh, representing a dog or a cat. And you could have the label being say one, zero a dog and one a cat. So you compare the outputs with the labels, and if it is a cat, the label will be one. If the model got it wrong and said that it is 0 0.2, it means that it is 80% confident that it is a, a dog and 20% confident that it is a cat. So it is sort of 80% wrong. So what, what we would do is to then take the difference between the outputs and the labels that is formally known as the loss. And we would take this loss as a guide to change the behavior of the neural network such that on its next iteration, given the same input, it will provide a slightly better output. And our goal here is to improve, is to change this behavior of the neural network in small incremental steps such that the output approaches the label. And once it is able to predict the label exactly, you will have accomplished your task. So this process of changing the behavior, tweaking the behavior of every single cell in the neural network such that its output approaches the label, that process is called backpropagation. And the technique, the mathematical technique that we use is called gradient descent. Pretty much all of the, pretty much a majority of the advances in AI that you see in the news or in the literature revolves around deep learning. And pretty much all of deep learning falls back down to this one fundamental concept of gradient descent via a uh, backpropagation via gradient descent. Now, I don't have the time to go into all the details and all the math about how all this works, um, but if you'd like to look this up, um, I'll be pointing to resources about this over the next few slides. Um, you could look up the terms backpropagation and gradient descent, also known as stochastic gradient descent. So, how do we get started with deep learning? What are the um, basic steps 
that you want to take to get started. You can think of this slide as a bit of a checklist to mark your progress as you get started in this, in this journey. And this slide is also pretty much a preview of my next 10 or so slides. And I will go through each of these items and talk about and give you pointers as to what you could, um, where you could go to in order to get more information. So first of all, you need to get, you need to understand a few concepts, especially in general data science and in deep learning. If you, for example, you already, you have already um, built traditional machine learning models to, um, to work with your, to work, to use in your research, um, you would probably be familiar, already familiar with various concepts on the left here. So uh, things such as data cleaning and wrangling, if the data is noisy or messy, um, you need to understand the differences between uh, training, validation, and test data sets. This is important in order to uh, reduce bias while training a model. You need to understand the differences between overfitting and underfitting. Essential if you want a model that is um, uh, independent and fair in its, in its judgment. You need to be aware of various common evaluation metrics. So accuracy is probably the most, it's probably something that everybody is familiar with, but um, you need to be familiar with um, other metrics such as uh, recall, sensitivity, precision, um, F1, whatever metrics that, that are out there, or even metrics that you design yourself uh, that, that are sensible for your research. Um, be familiar with some terms such as um, unsupervised versus supervised learning, which represents the the um, completeness of labels you have in your training data and understand the differences between regression, classification, and clustering, among others. With deep learning, um, I've really briefly covered the general structure of a neural network, the cells and the layers and so on, and I'll cover a little bit, little bit more over the next few slides, but I think in general, just understand how a deep learning, uh, a deep neural network is structured and its key components. Understand how a neural network learns, its loss function, its, um, how it performs back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. And understand that deep learning and neural, neural networks are oftentimes referred to as a black box where you have lots of knots and dials that you have to turn in order to get the model to perform right. These knots and dials are referred to as hyperparameters and there are quite a few standard hyperparameters that you should be familiar with uh, when tuning your model, such as batch size, the number of epochs, and the learning rate. When it comes to constructing neural networks, um, I like to think of it as um, the plumbing system in your house, where you start off with the uh, in input mains. It flows through various parts of your house, and then it probably, for example, ends up in the kitchen sink uh, tap outlet. And as a plumber, your job here is to make sure that data flows from input to output in a smooth and correct manner. And that means getting pipes of the correct shapes and sizes um, to go from, from your front door to your kitchen sink. And um, I think this is a point that is often underemphasized when it comes to constructing and debugging neural networks that go wrong. So um, you need to pay attention to the shapes of individual layers in, in your neural network, among other things, of course, um, such as the input shapes, the, the order of dimensions of the data that you need to pass into your models, uh, the output shapes of the models, and so on. I think this focusing on this aspect of the construction of your neural networks really helps to give you a low level hands-on understanding of the flow of information through that pipeline if you're interested to explore in that direction. Here are some deep learning resources that I would recommend you to check out um, in order to get yourself familiarized with the various concepts that I mentioned on the previous slide. First of all, I would recommend you to check out with your local university for various workshops, events, and seminars, such as this one here today, um, about the topic. Right. Oftentimes, these events are held for free for, for staff at a university. And so that's a very good resource to take advantage of. If you, you're the kind of person who prefers self-learning in your own time online, um, here are some really great channels that really introduces the fundamental concepts at very, in a very clear and, and precise way. Tree Blue and Brown uh, and Brendan Rothera um, provide very good explanations, while two-minute papers um, provides you with 
as the name indicates, two minute summaries of her of the latest research that is happening um, um, in the field. Of, um, I would I would do have to say that oftentimes because this is a YouTube channel, oftentimes these topics um, tend to be biased towards uh, topics that are a bit more uh, newsworthy, so to speak. If you like to read up um, blogs and articles online, towards datascience.com is a great page. You could go to, to learn about pretty much anything about machine learning and, and deep learning. Um, if you have the um, endurance and the stamina to sit through a 10 week or a 12 week course, um, do remember that MOOCs exist. Feel free to take full advantage of them. Um, Playground.tensorflow.org is a interactive fun website that you could use just to visualize how data flows through a very small toy model, um, a toy neural network. Um, I highly recommend it, you check it out after you understand what is happening um, behind the scenes. And last but not least, and I will spend the next few slides talking about this, is Galaxy. Um, but I'll leave that for just a bit. Um, once you are familiar with the fundamental concepts and would like to explore something more advanced, um, here are a few channels that you could use, that you could look at online on YouTube, which are great for the uh, more technical discussions. And last but not least here is this website, which I will refrain from pronouncing the name because I've actually never heard someone pronounce the name in, in real, in, in, in person to me. And so I just don't want to embarrass myself. That is an open source um, repository of a lot of research papers and it is my go-to place to look up the latest papers in, in um, deep learning. So Galaxy is a, um, as indicated on, the, indicated on the website, is a uh, scientific workflow, data integration and publishing platform that aims to make computational biology accessible to research scientists that do not have programming experience. And they have a lot of content out there, but I just want to narrow in on the machine learning content that they have as shown on the right here. And in particular, the deep learning tutorials that they have, um, that they have up there. These deep learning tutorials come in three parts and they cover the three most basic form of neural networks, uh, feed forward neural networks that work best with tabular data, recurrent networks that work best with time series data and convolutional networks that work best with spatially related data, such as images. There is also an introduction to deep learning in, in a general term um, that introduces you to the high level concepts. So I highly recommend you that you check out these resources. In the introduction to deep learning tutorial, they have this table here that sort of summarizes um, the various vicious directions that you might be working on and the candidate models that you could use in your research. And it covers the basics, you know, CNNs, convolutional networks, recurrent networks, and deep neural networks. Um, and, and then of course, there are various more uh, advanced stuff such as GANs, generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, and graph convolutional networks that you could explore once you're uh, more familiar in the field. In general, this is how I would summarize the deep learning workflow. If you recall, as a deep learning engineer, you are a curator of data. So you will start off with collecting and labeling the data. Labeling the data is perhaps the, the most um, effort consuming part of the whole process. And it, and it is often a deal breaker in many uh, situations. You would also have to select a model. Now I'm using the term here select rather than design a model because there have been lots of work done up to this date where researchers have spent lots of the time um, in designing the best models for to solve a problem. So my recommendation is to not reinvent the wheel, use a model off the shelf that you have gotten off somewhere from somewhere and use that in your research as starters. And once you have a better idea of what exactly you need, you can then to find, you can then start fine tuning the model to suit your needs. Now I have drawn this graph in a largely linear fashion, but in practice, that is often not the case. The real world is messy and non-linear. So oftentimes you will train your model, you validate it and you realize that it is not the model that is a problem, it is the data that is a problem. And so you need to go back right to the start to, to uh, have a look at your data and perhaps collect more 
balance uh, data sets. I like to say that deep learning is part art and part science. Like I said, there are a lot of knobs and dials that you need to turn and tweak in order to get the model to work right. And um, in, from the art part of things, generally I like to say, um, or I like to recommend to prioritize in this fashion. Um, I will start with, put the, the turning in of knobs aside, start with data volume and quality. Make sure that you have the right amount of data and make sure that, that the quality of the data is good enough for training a model. If, but once you are sure that that is resolved, then look at your loss function. A loss function is basically a mathematical um, instruction, I would say, that tells the model how to learn from the data. And if your instructions are wrong, obviously the model will learn a different objective than what you intended to learn. So check your loss function. Once you're sure that your loss function is correct, um, you can start playing around with your model architecture and the size of a model. And only at the very end, you look at tuning the dials to, to tweak the performance of your model. Oftentimes, people who are new to deep learning start in the reverse direction and start tweaking these dials right away, which usually um, isn't very, um, the, the reward for it usually isn't very great. Now, there are, very, there are many, many ways you could uh, implement deep learning solutions without having to program. So Galaxy is one of those approaches where you can, you can uh, train a neural network model with minimal programming skills. Um, you could also use some um, other commercial software such as MATLAB to train a neural network. But if you wish to have something customizable to your needs, then um, you probably need to pick up some form of programming. And, uh, and if you're working with deep learning, I would say 95% or, or around there of uh, deep learning is done in Python. Um, I won't go too much into, into this, but just a couple of notes. Is, first of all, is that, that be familiar with Python packages. If you need to write code that does a specific task that you think that somebody else probably needs to, be, needs to have done, you can safely guess that there is a Python package out there that already does it for you. So don't reinvent the wheel, use code written by someone else. Um, some commonly used packages for deep learning includes NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, OpenCV, and SciPy and perhaps Scikit-learn, uh, although these two are more applicable to machine learning than to deep learning. And then comes the big question that is perhaps one of the most frequently asked. Um, should I use TensorFlow and PyTorch or PyTorch? Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, TensorFlow and PyTorch, and among others, are um, software packages or rather pre-written code that people have, other people have, have developed that allows you to build deep neural networks and train them and evaluate them um, with minimal effort. In other words, you don't need to write your own code from scratch. Um, all you need to do is just use the pre-written code available in these packages here. And TensorFlow and PyTorch are the two most popular. Which one to use? Well, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately not able to answer that question for you. The two of them are very similar. Here's a graph showing the uh, adoptions over time. To give you a bit of a historical context, um, TensorFlow was the first to come out among others. And at the time, TensorFlow 1, that's version 1, was the best in the field. And so everybody went on to TensorFlow 1. Um, and then PyTorch came out. PyTorch originated from Torch, uh, which was written in a, in a less used programming language called Lua. Um, they created a Python version of it because everybody in, in machine learning was using Python, so then hence PyTorch. And PyTorch was a great step, was a great improvement over TensorFlow version 1. And so everybody started migrating towards PyTorch. Um, and at that time, they, there happened to be a lot of newcomers into the field of deep learning, and all those newcomers also went on board to PyTorch. Um, TensorFlow finally woke up and, and realized that they were losing the battle, and they, ca they came up with TensorFlow version 2, which is what we have now, which is very similar to PyTorch. And so at this stage, I would say TensorFlow version 2 or PyTorch, they are pretty much similar. Um, there are minor differences when you're working with more advanced features. But I think 
um, to answer your question of should I use TensorFlow or PyTorch, it is more likely that you would choose whatever your colleagues are using rather than any specific features that might, or might, not, uh, might not exist within the two packages. Unless you're looking for um, much more advanced such, such, as, such as, for example, I am familiar that the abilities in um, distributed parallel training of, of deep models across multiple GPUs, um, how you use them is slightly different in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Regardless of which package you use, both websites have excellent tutorials and boilerplate code that you could use to kickstart your, your programming journey in building these models. So I highly encourage you to um, check out these resources. And included in these resources are Google Collab uh, notebooks that allow you to run this code in, with single clicks. So, which is really useful if you want to play around with the code without having to set up any softwares in your own environment. All right, so with all the theory and with all the theory in place and all the tools available for you to start building models, then the next step you could take is to start training your own models as, an, as a um, first step to familiarizing yourself with the process of training models. The first thing you want to look at is your data set. Um, I'd like to emphasize that good quality data is essential for training a model. If you provide garbage in, you will get garbage out. So you want to think about what types of data you will need, how much data you will need, or, or how much data you can collect, and the quality of the data, make sure that it is balanced. For example, if you're training to detect uh, differentiate between dogs and cats, and you have 99 images of dogs and one image of a cat, that isn't a very good data set. Think about how you will collect the data, Think how you how about how you will store the data and label the data. Labeling the data, like I said, is probably the biggest challenge you would face. So and it's therefore it's something that you should pay careful attention to. Next, you want to pick the right neural network architecture. So in this diagram here, I've sort of um, simplified the, the structure of a neural network into this, into this diagram here where you need to be concerned about your input shape and your output shape because that determines the inputs and outputs to your network. Um, in the middle here, we have the network itself, which consists of a backbone and a head, and I'll elaborate on this later. And then finally, you will train a neural network on a loss function, basically a mathematical function that tells the neural network what to do. So choose the right neural network for the problem at hand. When it comes to the backbone, you need to eat the backbone usually depends on the, date, on the type of data that you have. If it's images, you want to go with a convolutional neural network. If it's time series data, such as languages, um, waveforms, signals, and so on, that come in a, in a linear fashion, in, in a time-based fashion, um, you want to look at recurrent networks, um, LSTMs, long short-term memories, and transformer models. And if you're dealing with very simple tabular categorical or numerical data, then just very standard fully connected layers or, or what is just referred to as deep neural networks would suffice. The head and the loss function depends on the objective that you want the model to perform. So if you want the model to perform classification, then you need a head that is suitable for classification along with a cross entropy loss function. If you want a model to perform image segmentation, and you want to look like a unit architecture. And if you want to perform and uh, we want a model to perform object detection, which is effectively drawing bounding boxes on a on an image, um, then you look at you need to look at something else. Once you're familiar with these basics, then you can look at other popular branches of deep learning, including um, GANs, generative adversarial networks, that um, what we normally refer to as creative AI. You can look at reinforcement learning where you have agents, AI agents that interact in a simulated environment, or you can look at unsupervised, semi-supervised, or self-supervised learning, or various forms of model training that work with limited labels. And last but not least, I just want to, um, I believe this will be my last slide, here to pick the right computing hardware. Deep learning is a very compute intensive workflow. Um, if you're just experimenting with toy models, you could just use your laptop or your desktop PC. Um, 
you obviously it will take literally a, on an order of magnitude longer to train your models. But if you're really working with toy models, if you're working with tutorials, that is usually sufficient. If you're going to train serious models, you probably need to look at the use of GPUs, graphic processing units, or TPUs, tensor processing units. So the first option is to get a GPU for your desktop PC. This is very convenient. You have a, your, your own customizable um, compute resource that you could use whenever you wish to. But obviously there is limited performance. I think the largest desktop PC you could have, uh, the most GPUs you could have in a desktop PC is probably around four. The second option is to use free cloud compute resources such as Google Collaboratory. This is free to use, but there are of course limitations such as such a fact that you can only use one GPU and you can run a script for 20, 24 hours at a time. Third option is to buy your own mini supercomputer if you had hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to burn. Uh, for example, the NVIDIA DGX A100, which is I believe the third generation of the DGX, uh, has five teraflops of compute at the cost of about 200,000 US dollars. Um, you can rent co um, compute time on cloud services such as Google Cloud Platform, AWS, and Azure, but the costs do add up significantly. Um, uh, the last time I checked, you, running a GPU full-time for about one to three months basically incurs you the cost of the entire GPU. Of course, you're paying for other services such as the accessibility of, of the resource, storage, CPU, compute, and other stuff but cost to add up. And last but not least, you might have HPC resources available at your, at your institution to access for free or through a membership-based uh, payment. So do check that out. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna cut it short here and open up for questions. I'll hand it back to you, Melissa. So yes, we do have time for questions. If you have a question for Titus, please write it into the Q&A box. And I can see there's already some questions coming through there. So the question that we are going to start with is, we've talked a little bit about the difference between deep learning, machine learning, and AI. And the question is, are there applications where traditional machine learning is a better alternative than deep learning? So we, we often like to jokingly call deep learning or neural networks as a black box. And it's largely true. Um, it is the black box because usually these models are large. They are able to build very complex models around the data that they, that they learn around. And so it is not easy to decipher how these models make decisions. And in situations where you need um, your models to be interpretable, you need to know that the model made this decision because of these various factors, then deep learning um, is problematic in that sense. And there are machine learning, traditional machine learning approaches that do better in that sense, such as decision trees, such as linear regression, and so on. Um, these, the trade-offs here is effectively model complexity versus explainability. And I think that is a trade-off that at this stage, is something that we can't that we can't get the best of both both worlds of. Thank you for that answer. So the next question we have on the list here is um, again related to when to choose different techniques, and the question is. Uh, do you have any general advice on what type of problems, especially in terms of the quality and amount of available training data, are a good case for applying deep learning? Um, can you repeat the question again? Uh, the, this person is uh, asking whether or not they should use deep learning when their training data is potentially sparse relative to the number of parameters to be determined, or if it is a bit noisy as well. Yeah, all right. So um, deep learning, so the, the fundamental ideas behind deep learning was, was um, invented perhaps three, four decades ago. It is, you know, it is not a really new concept. Deep learning has only taken off over the last decade or so because of the improvements in big data and the improvements in compute, compute powers. And deep learning is really powerful when you have a lot of data. 
if you're working with really sparse data with very noisy data, but noisy is something that we could potentially overcome. But if you have really small data sets that do not give a complete representation of you know, the, the various possibilities that could occur in the world, um, then you're going to have challenges with deep learning. Exactly how much data you will need for each particular problem, that I would put it under the, the art part rather than the science part of deep learning. So it really comes down to just giving it a try, see how it works, see what are its biases, and see if those biases can be overcome. Okay, so this is all that, unfortunately, all that we have time for today. We have a lot more questions coming through, but we are going to have to wrap it up. So thank you very much, Titus, for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to everybody who's come along as well. Before you leave, I have a, a couple more things to tell you about, uh, which may be of use to you. So if you just bear with me a moment and I will share my screen again. Okay, so the first things first is, as mentioned, this is part one of many webinars that we, we run at Australian BioCollins. And we have quite a few coming up in August, but that might be of interest to you. The next one will be in the first week of August. Uh, the details of this uh, will be up on the website shortly, and it will be focusing on NextFlow uh, Tower, and it will be a demonstration of how you can use that software. We also have a webinar on getting started with R. So if you're very new to bioinformatics and you want to use R to to kickstart your bioinformatics journey, this is the one to come along to. And then later in that same week, we have two webinars where we'll be exploring the types of compute that are available to Australian researchers and the different options that you have. And we'll also be looking at what you need to do in order to uh, submit and prepare an application to the NCMAS scheme for access to the high performance computing facilities within Australia. So details of all of those webinars can be found on the BioCommons website and underneath the events tab. So thank you again, Titus, and thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Finally, I would like to acknowledge our funding. The Australian BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. We hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now. Thanks. Bye.